of Isaiah. And of course, um, today is, I mean, tomorrow <laughs> will be Resurrection Day. Um, and yes. we celebrate Jesus rising from the dead. Amen. Amen. And uh, like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if Jesus didn't rise, then we are all dead in our sins. Mm -hmm. That's what the scripture says. If he didn't rise, we're dead in our sins. Um, there's no hope for us. If he doesn't rise, then we don't rise one day. So, but now that he has risen, one day we know when Jesus comes back, we're going to rise. Man. And we're going to have new bodies. Yes, Lord. <laughs> Thank you. Immortal bodies where we yes. cannot die. Yes. And so we thank God for the resurrection. So today, I'm going to talk on Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. And um, I'm going to title this, The Suffering and Risen Servant. The Suffering and Risen Servant. And since we didn't really have a chance to be here on uh, Good Friday, which uh, the church traditionally uh, celebrates the death of Jesus. Um, I'm going to put this all in one, and the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now, this is interesting because Isaiah chapter 53 is a very, very powerful chapter, and I encourage all Christians to read Isaiah chapter 53. Read Isaiah chapter 53 when you get a chance. Matter of fact, read the whole book of Isaiah, but definitely chapter 53 okay so let's go let's go um isaiah the book of isaiah has been called the gospel of the old testament and some people actually call it the fifth gospel so we got matthew mark luke and john but this has been called the gospel of the old testament because if you read the book of isaiah you're going to see a bunch of prophecies about jesus okay a lot of prophecies this is why it's very important to read the Old Testament. You cannot skip over the Old Testament as a Christian, okay? Isaiah, which was a prophet, he prophesied between 740 and 690 BC. That is important. Some people think, well, that's that's nothing to me. But I want everybody to understand something. We'll see the significance that the prophet Isaiah, he prophesied 700 years before Christ came, okay? And that is very important. And we can see these details because for people who believe the Bible is a bunch of fairy tales and, and the Bible is false, you see in the book of Isaiah where he's talking about Jesus 700 years before Jesus came. How could he have that knowledge? It's through God. God had to reveal that to Isaiah. So Isaiah, he talks about the virgin birth. He talks about the second coming of Christ. He talks about all these things, okay? And so when we're going over here in Isaiah 53, is what they call one of the four servant songs. Okay, so this is this is about the servant, and that servant is Jesus Christ. So now look at this. The book of Isaiah, it's like a mini Bible. Mm -hmm. It's like a mini Bible. There's 66 chapters inside of the book of Isaiah, just like we have 66 books in our Bible. Okay, and if you read Isaiah, the first 39 chapters are judgment. It's all judgment. Then the last 27 chapters, it's all redemption. Mm -hmm. It's all hope. And it parallels our Old Testament yeah. and New Testament. Because uh -huh. we know in the Old Testament, the first 39 books is what? It's a lot of judgment. It's what God's going to do. Then the last 27, the New Testament is hope. And that is Jesus Christ. So Isaiah parallels this perfectly. So in this Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to see the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay? Isaiah chapter 53. Now, let me say this. Let's start here. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. And I'm going to try my best to uh, explain this, I, I, I would say, in 45 minutes. But truthfully, Isaiah chapter 53, I, we can, so I could teach on this for weeks. Because there's a lot of deepness there. But what I'm going to teach today, it's enough for us to see that God chose Jesus. He died for our sins. And he rose from the dead on the third day. That's enough for us to see that. Now, remember, Isaiah was speaking to the nation of Israel. God's chosen people who went backwards, they went into sin, and this is why God sent the prophet Isaiah to them, because they were sinning. Now look what God, God is speaking these words through Isaiah. Look at Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. All a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly, they have forsaken the Lord, they have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. So God is talking about the nation of Israel. He said they completely gone backwards. Okay? They've forsaken the Lord. 
And this is the time when Isaiah was speaking to Israel. Look at verse 5. Verse 5. It says, why will, why will you still be struck down? Why will you continue to rebel? The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. So he's talking to the nation of Israel. He said, you are completely sick. And what did he mean by sick? He meant sin. Okay? He said, the whole heart is faint. So this is in the Old Testament. God is saying, the nation of Israel was completely just drowning in sin. Sounds like us, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sounds like us, how we were, drowning in sin. Now, let me say this. Now, let's go to the next verse. Isaiah 52 and verse 13. Now, let me say this. In our Bibles, when you open up your Bible, it starts in Isaiah 53 and 1. What a lot of people don't understand is that this chapter is supposed to start at verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 52. It starts here and then it works its way. Okay, and I'll please, I want everybody to remember this that uh, our Bibles didn't always have chapters. They didn't always have chapters and verses. Okay, we placed in chapters and verses. But this is where it's supposed to start right here Isaiah 52 and 3. And this is talking about Jesus Christ. This is a prophecy about Christ. So I want everybody to keep, get this. Now look at verse 13. It says, Behold, my servant shall act wisely. And his servant is Jesus. He will act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. So we know when Jesus rose from the dead, he was exalted. His name was exalted above all names. Okay? Now keep this in mind. Let's keep going. But look at verse 14. Watch this. Now the prophet goes back to his crucifixion. He says, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marked beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Notice what Isaiah says. He says Jesus' form, his face was so disfigured mm -hmm. that you could not even recognize him. Mm -hmm. That's how bad it was. And Isaiah, he says, it was worse than any children of mankind. So we know when Jesus was going towards that cross, they beat him so badly that you couldn't recognize him. You know, sometimes we see these movies and Jesus is just so nice and pretty. Mm -hmm. And he looks so, everything just looked perfect. But, but when they beat him, they disfigured his face that badly. And once again, and once again that disfigurement was for us. Mm -hmm. That was for us that they disfigured his face. Watch this. The next verse, verse 15. It says, so shall he sprinkle many nations. It's talking about Jesus. And then we, what he means by sprinkle? He will cleanse many nations. Okay, that's us. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them, they shall see. That which they have not heard, they will understand. So he said, even kings will turn to Christ. They will be quiet because they will hear this type of wisdom of salvation. Okay? And we know that throughout history, many leaders have come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So this is a prophecy. Now, let's go to Isaiah 53 and 1. Isaiah 53 and 1. Now look at this. This It continues on. Who has believed what he has heard from us? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Okay? So now the prophet Isaiah, he says, who has believed this message? Who's believed it? In other words, now, if you read this in the New Testament, this is showing that it would be people who would not believe the message because of the hardness of their heart. So Isaiah said, who, who's going to believe this? And he says, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Do you know what God's arm is in the Old Testament? The arm of the Lord represents strength, might, and power. And so the prophet says, who has seen the arm of the Lord? Who has been? Who has this been revealed to? And I want everybody to understand something. The arm of the Lord is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's Jesus Christ. Now watch this. You think about arm once again, strength and power. But now remember, we're about to see the cross. It looks weak to us, but that's the power of God. Watch this. Verse, verse 2. Look what it says. For he, that's Jesus, grew up before him, that's God, like a young plant, like a root out of a dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. So now look what this says here. Jesus grew up like a young plant, like a small shoot 
out of a dry ground. Now, what does he mean by dry ground? Well, guess what? Israel, during that time, they were spiritually dead. Mm. Spiritually dead. They had not had a word from, from God for 400 years. They only had some of the Old Testament books, but they didn't have a word from God. No prophet spoke at all. Okay, so during the time of the Old Testament, in between from Malachi to Matthew, no word was spoken. The people were dead. And here comes Jesus, growing up in this dry ground. He's coming up. Everybody's spiritually dead, but here comes Jesus. Now look what it says here. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. No beauty that we should desire him. Now what is that saying? This is talking about before the cross. When Jesus walked the earth, there was nothing beautiful about him at all. What, is the, what does the writer mean? What he's saying is there was nothing physically attractive about Christ. He didn't come in majesty. You know, when Christ walked the earth, he wasn't glowing, like once again, like you see in movies and pictures. There was nothing attractive about him. When people walked past Jesus, it wasn't like, wow, it's just something about him. It wasn't like that. Okay? There was no beauty that we desired of him at all whatsoever. Okay, so no elegance, no beauty, no grace. The only thing that attracted people to Jesus was God was yeah. yeah. That was it. Nothing on the outer. Only God working through him. That's it. Look at verse, look at verse uh, three. Let's keep going. Look at verse three. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. I want everybody to look at this. Jesus, when he walked the earth, was despised and rejected. Okay? In other words, people didn't want to be around him. They didn't want to accept Jesus Christ. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Do you know when Jesus walked the earth? I want everybody to imagine this. You have God in the flesh walking the earth, and he's among his creation, and he can sense and feel the unbelief of his creation, okay? He could see their hardened hearts, and it brings him sorrow and grief. Mm. So as Jesus walks the earth, he's full of sorrow, he's full of grief. Look what it says, men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I mean, you got to think about this. Before Christ came on the earth, he lived in heaven. And he enjoyed all the greatness of heaven. And he comes down to a people mm. that reject him. And he's full of sorrow. Okay? And he's hurting as he's walking the earth. Because he knows he loves his creation so much, but yet his creation has rebelled. Mm. This is what Christ went through. Okay? So he went through that sorrow. He went through that pain. Look at verse, look at verse uh, 4. Look at verse 4. Look what it says. I'm sorry. Yep, verse 4. The next verse. Verse 4. It says, surely, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Okay, so when Jesus walked the earth, he carried our sorrows. He carried our griefs. The Bible says we esteem him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. Now, when Jesus was on the earth, and I want everybody to catch this. When Christ was on the earth, people looked at him as he was being punished by God. That's, how, that's what they thought. So when Jesus was on the cross, when he's walking, people saying he's being punished because of his own sins. Mm. That's how they looked at Jesus. So they said he deserves what was coming to him. This is how they looked at Jesus. But watch this now. Look at verse 5. Isaiah 53 verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. So watch this. He wasn't suffering because of his own sins. No. Jesus was suffering because of our sins. Yeah. Yeah. So the punishment of God was coming upon Christ. Mm -hmm. So he was pierced for our transgressions. That word transgression means rebellion. Okay. So, so we were rebelling against God and God pierced him for our rebellion. All right? For our rebellion. Mm. Now, he didn't suffer because of his sin. Because why? He had no sin. He had no sin. But we suffered. Look what it says. I want everybody to look at the words that is being used. He was crushed for our iniquities. My God. Crushed. Yeah. Crushed.
Christ on the cross, and we're going to see this more, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. What is chastisement? Now, everybody knows you have a child. You've chastised your child before, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody chastised their child before because they got out of hand. The mm -hmm. Bible says that the chastisement was upon Christ that we deserve. My God. Okay? So I'm speaking in our language today. The, the whooping that we deserved, it came upon Christ. Yes. It came upon Christ. And his chastisement brought us peace. My God. Think about this. As he's suffering, and God, he's this, this sacrifice for the Lord, this is going to bring us peace. And what does it mean by peace? We talked about this before. This is twofold. Because before we were saved, we, had, we were at odds with God. We were his enemies. Yeah. And then the blood of Christ now has brought us close to God, and we are now his friends or his children. So we have peace. And we have inward peace. And that's through the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean? We talked about this. We have peace because we don't need we don't need drugs. We don't need drinking. We don't need the things of the world anymore. Right. Because we have peace. And look what it says. And with his wounds, we are healed. What does it mean? He's not talking about physical healing. Mm -hmm. He's talking about spiritual healing. Thank you, Lord. The wounds of Christ that he suffered on that cross. And if you look this up, this is talking about wounds, wounds that is permanent. Mm. Permanent wounds brought us, or it healed us. It healed us. This is what happened with the cross. Look at verse 6. We almost there. I want everybody to look at this. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So now Isaiah says we was like sheep going astray. We turn everyone to his own way. So what does that mean? All of us are walking in our own sins. We say, you know what, God? I don't want you. I'm going to do what I want to do. And God, the Bible says, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? The punishment for adultery, God placed it on Christ. My God. The punishment for lying, God placed it on Christ. The punishment for stealing, he placed it on Christ. All the punishment for every type of sin you can imagine, it was placed upon Jesus Christ. Yes, yes. When he was on the cross. And this is what people call the great exchange. Mm. Jesus took our sin, and in exchange, we took his righteousness. Yes. Okay? So he takes our sin, we take his righteousness. That is the great exchange. Mm -hmm. This is what happened upon the cross. Okay? So now think about this. If, if I accept Jesus... <laughs> I don't have to face the punishment anymore. Because why? He already took it for me. If I walk in this way and accept him, he's already taken that punishment. I don't have to face it anymore. So watch this. Let's keep going. We're almost there. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. It says, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened out his mouth. Okay, so Jesus, he went through oppression when he was on the earth. He was afflicted. People with it was against him. They talked about him. They beat him. But guess what? He didn't even open his mouth. He didn't say one word mm. to fight against these people. Not one word. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before it shears is silent, so he opened out his mouth. So guess what? Jesus is like a lamb going to the slaughter. Now, John 1 and 29 said he is the lamb of God. Yes. And he takes away the sin of the world. So now he's, he's like a lamb. He's just going to the slaughter to be killed. And he's completely quiet, not saying nothing. Mm -hmm. Anybody remember the gospel stories when they brought Jesus before Pilate? Mm -hmm. They brought him before Herod? And what happened? Jesus was just quiet. Yes. He didn't say anything. He didn't say anything. Okay? Like a sheep before it shears is silent. Just like they take those lambs and they and they, they, they cut all the, the wool off of them and they're just completely silent. They submit. Now, this doesn't mean that Jesus was helpless. I don't want everybody to get confused because Jesus chose this. This is a willing sacrifice. Look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 17. Look what Jesus says, and I love this. He says, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. Lord. Notice what Jesus said. I'm laying down my life. Mm -hmm. Nobody's, nobody has power over me. I'm doing this. And look at verse 18. He says, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. 
I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my father. Notice what he says here. He says, listen, I could, I'll let down my life, but I'll call, I'll, I'll, I can also raise myself back up. Mm -hmm. And he said, God has given me this authority. So Jesus, he died, but he also rose himself from the dead on the third day. That was the power of God. Mm -hmm. God gave him that authority. So this is a choice. This is a choice that Jesus made. Now look at this. Look at verse 8, Isaiah 53 and 8. Look what it says. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. Now, when they, well, before they crucified Jesus, he had a fake court case. It wasn't supposed to happen the way it happened. Mm. They just came up with some charges mm -hmm. because why did they want to kill Jesus? They were jealous of him. Oh my God. He was taking the crowds away from the priests and the Pharisees. Mm. And so they said, okay, you know what? We have to kill him. And so they gave him a whole fake court case and condemned him to death. So by oppression, and that means unjust judgment, Christ was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living? Stricken for the transgression of my people. Now, the Bible says his generation. What is interesting, this verse is saying when Jesus walked the earth, he didn't have any kids. This was weird. Now, y'all might say, well, that's no big deal. Yes, it is. Because most Jewish men at that age had a family. And Jesus walked the earth, and he was cut off in the prime of his life. And so they say, well, he was stricken, cut off of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. So he didn't have any offspring. He didn't have any offspring. And of course, we know that, that uh, Jesus wasn't thinking about that. He was just thinking about dying for the sins of the world. Mm. Watch this. Verse 9. Verse 9. Look at this. Look at this prophecy here. It says, they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. And this is a prophecy about Christ. So guess what now? When Jesus, we all know when Jesus was dying, what happened? He was hanging between two thieves. Mm -hmm. They treated Jesus like a criminal. He's like a criminal. They treated him like a wicked man. And it says with a rich man in his death, what happened? Who buried Jesus? It was a rich man. Mm -hmm. Okay, look at this real quickly. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 27. Matthew, Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. It says, when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. So here goes Joseph of Arimathea. He's a disciple of Christ. He's rich. Look at this. Verse 58. He went to Pilate, asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. Okay, so he asked Pilate, I need the body of Christ. Get, take the body down from the cross and give it to me. Next verse. And Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen shroud, and he laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. So he cuts out this tomb. Now, Joseph, he bought this tomb for himself. Yes. Uh -huh. He's a rich man. Uh -huh. So he says, I'm buying this tomb for myself. But then when he, his love for Christ, he says, I'm going to let Jesus use it. Right. My God. But he didn't know Jesus about to rise from the dead. Okay? As Jesus was just brought on his tomb, but he had no idea. I'm just right. He's going to rise from the dead. Okay? So this prophecy, remember, I wonder if I remember this. Isaiah wrote this 700 years before Jesus. My God. How could the details be so exact? My God. It's God's power. Mm. People keep saying the Bible is fairy tale. Mm -hmm. People not reading. No, no. How could a man write this 700 years before Christ came? If it was just a normal thing, a man guessing, no, no, no. This is God revealing this to Isaiah. Mm -hmm. The Bible is true. Yeah. And we can look at the prophecies and see that it's true. Let's keep going. Let's keep going. We almost there. So look what it says. Look what it says. I'm sorry. Go back. Go back to uh, verse nine. It says uh, they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. And I want everybody to keep that. He's treated like a wicked man, but guess what? There's no violence. He did no violence. Mm. And, and there was no deceit in his mouth at all whatsoever. Didn't tell a lie. Wasn't out to uh, scheme people. But yet he was treated like a wicked man. Okay. He's treated like a wicked man. Look at this, y'all. Isaiah 53 and 10. And I love this verse, and we almost done. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Look what it says. And I want everybody to look at this. Yet, it was the will of the Lord to crush him. My God. Mm. Notice this. This word will, 
It literally means desire or pleasure. Now, it's not mean like God was getting pleasure like in a sick way. Mm -hmm. But God, desire and will was to crush Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. So guess what God did? Now, did God command those men to crucify Jesus? No. But what God did, he used their actions to crucify the Messiah. Mm -hmm. They chose to do this. But it was God's will to crush him. The father said, I am going to crush my son on the cross for the sins of mankind. Look at this. He has put him to grief. God put Jesus to grief. Gave him pain for us. And this is an example. I want to look at this. Luke chapter 22, verse 41. Luke 22 and 41. And after that, we're going to go back to Isaiah 53. Luke chapter 22 and 41. Look what it says. This is verse 41, Isaiah. This is when uh, Jesus, he's, he's going before the Father, and, and he uh, he's goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is feeling the weight and the pressure of going before God to die for the sins of mankind. Look what Jesus prays. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, yours be done. Mm -hmm. Look what he says. Father, remove this cup. What is this cup? Now, if you read the Old Testament, I didn't put the scriptures in here. The cup in the Old Testament represents God's wrath towards the wicked. Okay, so God would always symbolically give his cup for the wicked to drink. And Jesus says, Father, remove this cup from me. Mm. Now, this is not just talking about the nails on the cross. I want everybody to hear this. Jesus felt something that we will never understand. Never. Because he felt the weight, the wrath, and the punishment of our sins. And when Jesus knew he had to face that, he said, Father, remove this cup. Mm -hmm. What begins to happen? Jesus said, I don't, I don't want to go through this. Now, some of y'all going to say, no, my Savior, that makes my Savior weak. No, it doesn't. Pay attention. He says, now look what Jesus says. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He says, Father, listen, I don't want to take this cup, but I don't want to go by my own will. Let your will be done. Yeah. You may want me to take this cup. Look at the next verse. Look at verse 43. It says, there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. So as Jesus is praying, this angel comes and begins to strengthen him. It's giving him strength to hold up. Look at the next verse. Verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Jesus is in pain. Oh my God. He's in agony, crying out to God. Tears. That's what Hebrews chapter 5 and 7 says. With strong tears, he's crying out to God. He's in agony. Look what the Bible says. His sweat became like great drops of blood. Falling to the ground. Notice this. Jesus begins to sweat blood. Oh my God. Now what does that mean? Go to the next slide. Even today, now this is a true medical condition. Hematidrosis. It happens when a person feels intense fear or stress. Oh my God. In rare instances, the fight, flight or fight response can trigger the ruptures of the capillaries in the body. Capillaries are tiny blood vessels located throughout the tissue. They carry essential nutrients to different parts of the body. Capillaries are also located around the sweat glands. In case of severe fear or stress, these tiny blood vessels can burst and cause blood to exit through the body through the sweat glands. Oh my God. So Jesus, he's praying, and this stress and fear comes upon him. Oh my God. And these blood vessels burst and they go through his sweat glands. And he's sweating blood. Sweating blood. Now I know somebody's gonna say, well, wait a minute. Fear? The Bible says God didn't give us a spirit of fear. Don't, don't, God can't take that scripture out of context. Because mm -hmm. he was talking to Timothy. Timothy was young and he was afraid to preach the gospel. That's why Paul told him that. But here, Jesus had a right to fear. And I want everybody to understand why. Because he's about to face God's wrath. Mm -hmm. He has a right to be afraid. And I want everybody to hear this. Ooh, if Jesus was afraid of God's wrath, what about you? Oh, I know that's right. The mm. Son of God, who is sinless, oh my God. didn't want to face that. 
And now you got people running around here saying, I'm not afraid of hell. They don't know what they're talking about. They don't know. Don't have but a son of God. My God. Fear God's wrath. Mm. Who are you? Who are you? This is real. And so Jesus, now, I didn't put the other scriptures there, but as, as it keeps going, Jesus prayed three times. And he said, Father, if this cup will not be removed unless I drink it, let your will be done. My God. My God. And as he prays, what happened? He gets up, he's strong, and now he's ready to go die. Jesus. And that's just a side message for us because yes. prayer would take us through. Yes. If, we, if we saw Jesus call on the Father, then what do we have to do? Call on him. When we hit these situations, we have to call on the Father for strength. Christ showed us he did it. We have to do it as well. Yes. We have to do it as well. Okay? So guess what? Listen, if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you're going to have to drink the cup one day. Oh, yeah. my. Eternally. That's right. Mm. He drank the cup for us. If you don't accept him, you're going to have to drink that cup one day. Mm. And that's the eternal cup. Oh, yes. My God. Oh, yes. Let's go back. We're, we're almost there. Resurrection. I told you I want to get the death and resurrection in. Look at verse 10. Isaiah, go back to Isaiah 53 and 10. So look what it says. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, mm. his soul made an offering for guilt. We were guilty before God. My God. And his soul made this offering. But now watch the powerfulness. This is the resurrection. Look how anxious. Look at the contrast. His soul makes an offering for guilt, but look what it says. He shall see his offspring. Mm. Who is Jesus' offspring? The church. Us. Yes. The body of Christ. We are his offspring. Look what it says. He shall prolong his days. How did Jesus prolong his days when he died on the cross? Because God rose him on the, day, on the third day. That's how he prolonged his days. This is the resurrection. Mm. Right here in Isaiah chapter 53. Look what it says. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Lord. Everybody remember when Jesus was on the cross? He yelled out what did he say? It is what? It is finished. Yeah. I finished the work. Mm. I've accomplished what you wanted me to. This is the resurrection. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 3. Look what it says. This is Paul talking to the Corinthians. He said, I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Yes. This is Paul. He knew the Old Testament. And he said, Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures. Look at verse 4. Next verse. He was buried and he raised on the on, and raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. Lord. And please remember this, because if you want to show somebody about the resurrection of Christ, you can point it right here. Yeah, the Bible already, Paul talked about this, and it comes from the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And I didn't put the other verses here, but Paul talked about how when Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to 500 people at one time. My God. It's all the evidence right here in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15. Yeah. Jesus rose from the dead. The last verse, Isaiah 53 and 11, and we're finished. Look what it says. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Mm. Man, Jesus, he was in anguish. And look what it says. He's going to be satisfied. Why? Because he knows his death accomplished its mission. Hallelujah. And that was to save sinners like us. Yes. It accomplished its mission, so he was satisfied. Look what it says. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. It says, once again, what will Jesus do? We will be accounted righteous because of him. He puts righteousness to our account. Yes. Because he rose from the dead. And so we thank God for the resurrection. Amen. Yes. Amen. Yes. On, Hallelujah. For the resurrection. Glory yes. to God. What Jesus did on the cross, yeah. the price he paid, is it's just, it's, it's, sometimes it's just hard to fathom the price he paid for us. And how could we not want to serve a savior like this? That did so much for us. Come on, y'all. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Hallelujah. Let's all stand.